So the first question for someone who has Gemini's, Jesse's, Orders of Canada, Gascon Tom, is there a theater in Canada that you haven't played in? Yes, I haven't played in Newfoundland. And I haven't played in Halifax. I did a, I did a tour of, of something through the Maritimes, so I feel as if, I don't feel as if I belong until I've, I've felt the audience in the different places. And the place where I'm most at home is, of course, Saskatchewan. I think there's something in the salmon business that, you know, salmon go home. I think that's where I was born and that's where I was most at home on the stage. And you actually feel that when you're on the stage? You recognize it afterwards that it, yeah, I think you do. You just feel more comfortable faster. That's all. It's not mystic really, but. Is there a mystic, I mean, let's jump into the deep end here. Is there a mystic part to performing? Do you think uh, this passion that you, you have and that I have had all my life is a drug or a calling? Yeah. Yeah. Which do you think it is? Uh, it is a drive to do something that you cannot express. It comes from a place you cannot understand. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, no, I don't think it's a drug. For some people, I think it's a neurosis but I don't think that's the root of the great performance. God, we'd have a lot of talk about if we got on that <laughs> subject, wouldn't we? I think actually it is a calling, and I don't think it's a surprise that I should have had a father who was a United Church minister in the prairie in Saskatchewan and a mother who was a nurse in the time of Florence Nightingale. She was in inspired by Nightingale, you know, and she, she went to all those meetings in London that were the suffragette meetings. So that's where I came from. So it's not a surprise I ended up in the theater. And you think you picked that up through your parents at home? Yeah, like the way they lived their lives and what, how they dedicated their lives to, to their community and to the people. Yeah, I, I also think that um, the thing we're involved in if we're talking about the theater, the performing arts, is um, I think the state of the performing arts equals the estate of the society. So if they're not doing well, society is not doing well. And if they're doing well, we're, we're getting there. So I really do believe that what we do is important to the people we live with. And you mean specifically when you go to the Vancouver Playhouse or if I go down to the Arts Club and what I see, if, if the Arts Club is vibrant and producing, you think the culture then around it is really, st is, is likewise vibrant? Depends what they're doing. Depends what the quality is, depends what that theatre is. I, I, in Vancouver, it would depend, it would depend, yeah, the people believe exactly what we believe, that the theatre is important. Uh, they've got to get the people in, see? They've got to get the people in, so they may compromise what they think they should be doing. There's one company here that uh, is a festival that doesn't, I don't think, compromise called the Push Festival, which does marvelous stuff every time. Uh, that's different. When you have to survive every day in a place like Vancouver, in the theater, or in the opera, or in the ballet, it's tough. It's really difficult because people don't come to Vancouver to, do, to go to the theater. People come to Vancouver to ski and to uh, climb and to sail. And so you have to talk them into the importance of these things and you have to woo them. And if you have to woo them with something that uh, is um, fun for the moment, fine. That's marvelous. It's part of the whole tapestry of it all. Then what is the difference with a culture or a city that actually people come to it for its theater? Um, what the difference they... between Vancouver and Winnipeg. See, Winnipeg, I swear in Winnipeg, if anyone tried to, in Winnipeg to take the ballet away or MTC away, people would line up like uh, um, that children's story about the, 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 where they all line up to defend Christmas. <laughs> you know, 
the one, the who? Oh, Grinch. Grinch, the Grinch. They would line up around those buildings even, holding hands and put, them, put their bodies on the floor to prevent anyone taking any of those things away. So it wouldn't happen the, in Vancouver. If they shut the Playhouse and the Arts Club and the other theatres, you think life would go on normally in Vancouver? I wouldn't think so, but yeah, most people would think so. So now that we're talking about Vancouver, there was a, 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 it was a 40% cut from the BC, Arts, BC government, was there not? What's that about? I don't know. I think it's just disgraceful and suicidal and stupid. It's just plain stupid to cut away. Because it's not just the arts they're cutting away, it's the it's social services they're cutting away. They're cutting everything. And they're taking money out of that one pool they had, which was the gambling money. The, I, can't, I don't know what it's called officially. Lottery, lottery. Lottery money. They took, they took a lot of that. It's so, it's, it, you know, what's the opposite of farsighted? It's not nearsighted, it's, it's, it's going back to what? So in fact we're talking about the, how much does the culture around the arts, how much does the political culture and the social culture actually want the culture of arts to exist? And we're saying in BC they don't really want it to exist? Well, if they do things like that, obviously that's proof they don't want it. They would deny it if you spoke to anyone individually. They know they want, their, they want it for their children. So you know, they want everything there for their children. But when they vote like that and when they take it, it's murder. I mean, it's killing life. This is the great Canadian conundrum. And it's interesting yeah, to talk yeah. because you played across the country and let's take Quebec, because in Quebec, uh, you know, uh, uh, our Prime Minister Stephen Harper made an odd comment that, you know, the artists are people who whine too much at galas about their grants. And the political blowback from the culture in Quebec lost the Conservative seats. By saying that, that, you know, artists are people who just whine at galas about their grants being too small, he actually lost the majority government by losing seats in Quebec. The Quebecers were so incensed. As you say, they held hands around that. Yes. So why does Quebec do that and we can't do that in English Canada? Because, because uh, their, their language, their, um, which is the soul of a people, their language, their poetry, their uh, existence was endangered, their existence in the world, on the earth, was endangered by their arts being cut back. I, I, I was, when I was there, I realized that, maybe it's not true anymore, but when I was there, which would be the late 60s, a, a Quebec family would invest in the child who wanted to go to the National Theatre School or who wanted to be a musician, um, where people here in the West would invest in the child that was going to be a dentist or a doctor or other essential people, yeah. but uh, nothing to do with why we're here or why other people are important in our lives or what is poetry, what are we what are we trying to express that is lasting? It's a different people. But an interesting, I don't know whether this is interesting for the, our, our talk today, but I, I went to the 50th birthday of National Theatre School. It was why I wasn't at, at the, receiving the other thing at the, um, in Toronto. It was the same day. And I heard the Premier and the Mayor of Montreal speak at a National Theatre School 50th birthday. Now, when I was there, my students were being arrested because it was the October crisis and they, they weren't known in their community and they were only. The mayor and the premier this time were so, they were charming, they were witty, they obviously were enjoying being there, but they were politically verbally passionate about the fact that it was very important that the National Theatre School be in Montreal. 
And they were pouring money into it too, but they were pouring um, wit and humor and, uh, and welcoming into this event. And you know, we always used to say, well, no, I can't stay in Quebec, it's got to go to Toronto, you've got to take the English, put them there. And, and so there's a political change there, welcoming. They said the people coming from right across Canada and then going right out across Canada or across the world. This became important. So there's something different there that was quite startling. But you knew from the beginning you were going to have to come back and fight for everything. Fight for the first children's theater, fight for the, for the, the first department of drama, fight for the theater, fight for the space. You just took it for granted. Who taught you to fight for the theater? Mm, everybody I studied with. Starting with, starting with Dorothy Somerset, who said, um, theater is the pursuit of the good. How's that, Socrates? And a you know, minister's daughter is going to go, oh, I want to do that. Um, and she also said, if you dare to go in the theater, you will have moments of uh, ecstasy, but you will also have to go through moments of agony. I remember that's one of the last speeches I heard her give at the Arts Council here. So yes, and then I went to, when I went to uh, Chicago, I'd been there two weeks and I had my bags packed to come home because I decided I didn't want to be like the people that were teaching me. And what were they like? Well, they were post-war and they, if they were directors, they wanted to be actors. If they were actors, they wanted to be directors. They were designers. Would be, you know, everybody was in a state of, of, uh, of uh, disillusion, but it was a post-war thing, I realized after. Anyway, I didn't different. want to be like them. I'm sorry? This was at the University of Chicago? No, this is the Art Institute of Chicago. This is Goodman Theatre. Right. And um, so the day I was going to go to the head of the school and say, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm going to go back to Canada and you know, do it my way because I don't want to be like these people when, they're, when I'm old. They were only in their 30s. But down the hall, there bounced a lady with this color hair and Around her, there were sort of people doing this, where they, they were seen to be dancing to me, and they were all laughing, and some of them were singing, and I said, who is that? And they said, that's Corpenning. I said, what does she do? They said, children's theater. I said, how old is she? They said, 84. I said, no, they said, 82. It's 84 I am now. They said, 82, and I thought, ah, that's what I want to be like at 82. What was her name? Charlotte Corpenny. And she used to write the plays as well, you know. So. And so I became her assistant. And when I came back to Canada, I started the first children's theater. But she had fought her way <laughs> to creating children's theater there. So I knew that I had to use everything I had to talk people into it. That was easier than some of the later theaters. Though.